Uh, we mostly work in the Midwest region, but lately we've been expanding and working for um, places on the East Coast, the West Coast, and as far down as you know, Birmingham, Alabama, or Louisville, Kentucky. So we pretty much take <laughs> anything that comes our way. Um, so let's see. Uh, this is just a list of our member institutions. Uh, you don't have to read them all, and I'm not going to quiz you, but just to show you how many, how, mem how many members we have. And your church is one of our members. Um, as a member institution, um, you do get um, conservation treatments as well as other services. And I'm going to talk about some of the other services we do in a minute. Um, but I wanted to kind of ask you guys what you think is a what you think a conservator is and what you think a conservator does. Um, we often get, um, we're often called restorers, which is not the term we prefer. Um, we basically, unlike restorers, we don't try to return the work of art to a new condition. We're not trying to make the work of art look as it did you know, 400 years ago or four or 500 years ago. Our aim is to stabilize the work of art, respectively and appropriately, so that um, so we ensure it for kind of its safety for future generations. Um, we are minimalist in our approach. We try to be less invasive than restorers. Um, there's a lot of research that goes into um, a conservation of painting, and I'll go over, you know, what happens when a painting comes to a lab. Um, how do we look at it? You know, what, what steps we take before we proceed to treatment. Um, so, basically, art conservation focuses on the preservation of historical, artistic, and cultural property. Uh, we work to combine an understanding of material science, historic techniques, and art history. Uh, to make informed decisions to preserve these works of art. Any questions on that? All good? All right. So in addition to treatment, we offer a lot of other services to both our members and private individuals. Um, any of you can call us anytime if you have any questions. Uh, we get a lot of calls for emergency assistance. So if you know something got flooded or um, we get a lot of calls from artists, for example, asking about materials or something happening to their paintings. You know, how do I varnish a work of art? Um, what's my first step if I see a bug inf infestation? So we provide those services. It's part of our mission as a nonprofit organization to everyone who calls in. Uh, we do workshop uh, workshops. And you see right here an example of um, kind of salvage after a flood workshop. Uh, let's see. We do collection surveys where one of our conservators comes in and basically does a survey of a whole collection, a really quick look, uh, looking at light levels, looking at humidity, environmental conditions, and then makes recommendations to the organization on how to proceed. Um, so you can call us anytime. This is the Paintings Conservation Lab. Uh, we have, let's see, four specialties. Um, paper conservation, which includes drawings, prints, uh, photographs, <laughs> objects conservations, which is basically anything you can imagine from marble to baskets to uh, frames. Um, and I know I'll, some of the frames have been worked on by Mac here as well. Uh, we have textiles. Um, and paintings. And I, I think some of you may have been to the Paintings Conservation Lab uh, during our open house or maybe during the private tour uh, with this church. But um, I wish I had a pointer. <laughs> um, but this is part of the lab, the way it's set up. You see some of the um, fume trunks. So that's for extra extraction of vapors from various solvents that we commonly use. Um, we have, it's not in the picture, but we have a whole spray booth um, with an air extraction that allows us to use kind of more harsh chemicals um, and be safe and um, varnish paintings, for example. Uh, we have microscopes. Uh, there's one in the back over there. Pretty much all of the tools that we need. Um, we've recently acquired an infrared camera 
that allows us to look at under drawings and paintings. So it's basically a technology that can penetrate through the paint layers to look at the first drawing of the artist that the artist makes before putting on the paint. We're really excited about it. It's a, it's a non-destructive technique that you, know, um, you can learn a lot from. Um, we have a lining table. I'm gonna talk about lining. So this big table on which we have the frames and the paintings right now actually comes apart and it's a hot suction table that allows us um, to line a painting, which means put another piece of fabric, um, kind of join another piece of fabric onto the original to provide additional support. And remember linings, because I'm gonna talk about it um, with regard to your painting. So when um, any object, be it, be it a painting and frame, a drawing, when it comes to the lab, we do a full um, treatment proposal and a condition report. So we look at the structure of the painting and its condition. We usually start from the back. We examine the auxiliary support, be it a stretcher or a wooden panel. Um, we look at the ground layers, the paint layers, the varnish layers. Um, so everything that goes into the construction of a painting. Um, we use ultraviolet light illumination to look for um, varnishes, for example, or previous retouching, previous um, in painting campaigns that have been done. Uh, we look closely under the microscope to make sure, you know, whether it's flaking, um, if, if there is paint lifting. Um, the, a lot can be told with just looking very, very closely at the painting. In addition to that, we conduct tests. So solvent tests with different chemicals to see um, you know, what the varnish structures are if the overpaint comes off. And we also communicate a lot with curators or stewards of the collection um, to kind of move forward with the treatment together. So we're not making decisions alone. If a painting comes, you know, I, I can propose a treatment to a curator, but a lot of the time it's a conversation. Um, a steward of the collection, a curator may be coming um, to the painting with a more art historical perspective. You know, I'm coming from the material science aspect of it. So bringing those two together is very, very important and that kind of dictates our decisions. So that's exactly what happened when your painting came to the lab. I really wanna see it, so I'm gonna, I'm sorry, I'm gonna be turning. <laughs> um, maybe I can, I don't know if I can hold, I should hold it. I'm gonna hold it. There we go. Okay. I think we're okay. Yeah. Okay, that's better. Um, so that's exactly what we did when the painting came to our lab. Uh, we first looked very, very closely at it. And right away, you know, even from this image, which is really dark, but I, I think you can see that um, there's a lot of previous work that's gone into it. The painting doesn't look so good. Um, in the clouds, uh, you see that kind of strange variation, darker spots. That's previous retouching that has changed over time. Um, the image is very dark. A lot of areas are very illegible. Um, and then the varnish doesn't provide proper saturation. The painting just looks kind of dark and dirty. Um, and we see that a lot with um, old master paintings, with traditional paintings on canvases when they come in. Um, things that haven't been cleaned for, you know, a hundred years or so. So this is a 17th century painting. It's around, I want to say mid 17th century. Mm -hmm. So pretty old, <laughs> really old. Um, so usually we first look at the back of a painting. Um, this one was, um, did not have a backing board. So a backing board is can be a piece of a blue board or a foam core. It basically serves to protect the painting from dust, accumulation of dust, debris, and also mechanical damage that can be caused when you're moving an artwork. 
Um, I think you can even see on the bottom stretcher member, you know, kind of that white, white line, that's dust. That's basically dust and dirt that has accumulated there for years and years and years. Um, there was a lot of debris, you know, spider webs trapped between the lower stretcher member and the canvas. So it was extremely dirty. Yes. Yeah, but even, um, even if a painting comes from a museum and it doesn't have a backing board, over the years you will get this accumulation of dust, kind of no matter what. You can keep your environment as tight as you, <laughs> as you can and still, um, you know, with our filtration system, still you'll get a lot of dust. Um, I mean, I think about my house. I feel like I'm dusting every, every week, <laughs> you know, no matter what. Um, so what we have here, um, is a stretcher with keys. And maybe this is a little too elementary, but I just kind of want to go through, through everything so um, there's no questions. Um, we're not sure if the stretcher is original or not, probably not. Um, and the kind of fabric canvas that you see on the back is actually not original to a painting. It's a lining fabric. So paintings were lined pretty typically uh, during especially the 60s, 70s, and 80s in this country as a way to stabilize them. Um, it was believed that the painting support, the canvas, is so fragile that it's not going to last on its own for many years. So paintings, where the, whether they needed it or not, were just lined, kind of prophylactically. Um, this canvas uh, justifies the lining because it was very damaged. Um, but the lining was done with a glue paste adhesive. So there's various adhesives that you can use. You know, we see a lot of wax lining where basically a painting is, <laughs> I don't want to say dipped in wax, but um, hot wax is applied with an iron. So just imagine, you know, just this hot, big, you know, <laughs> thing of wax being poured onto a painting in order to attach another canvas. In this case, with a glue paste, um, it's usually a glue, like a rabbit skin glue, um, a flour, water, sounds like a cooking recipe, and sometimes honey, um, which serves as a plasticizer. So that is something we no longer use. It's been used in the past. Um, it can create problems sometimes, or it can be stable. In this case, it's very stable. Um, it's in a, you know, the painting is in a good environment. Um, the problems we see with glue paste linings is uh, degradation of glue as it becomes brittle. Any animal glue, like rabbit skin glue, will age over time and embrittle. Um, sometimes we see infestations of insects because they're attracted to all of those yummy flour and honey materials inside. But in, the, in this case, it was absolutely stable. We did not see any delimination between the canvas, um, the original canvas and the lining, so there were no air pockets in between. So we did just decided to retain the lining. Um, linings have been removed in the past and this is just an example of how something like that is done. So it's done mechanically by kind of pulling uh, very carefully, um, sometimes getting in there with a scalpel to break up the glue uh, and removing that additional fabric piece by piece. We decided not to do that because of the fragility of the canvas. Um, it would really put a lot of stress on the original work, and we could have lost a lot of original materials, a lot of paint layers, a lot of ground layers by doing that. So we took a more minimalist approach and just stabilized areas around the edges um, that were missing. So what you see here, and I can't come. <laughs> Um, on the top, uh, do you see that the fabric is a bit different, it's lighter? That's basically a new canvas that has been inserted uh, to provide additional support. 
rather than re replacing the entire canvas, we just went around the edges to make sure that the canvas is tacked onto the stretcher and is stable and that the tension is good. Uh, we cleaned the back, of course, <laughs> and I'm just showing you some of the um, common cleaning tools we used. Um, we used a lot of rubber, um, vulcanized rubber sponges, cosmetic sponges that we get at um, <laughs> you know, regular stores like Target in bulk, and people always look at you in a weird way when you do that. <laughs> those are those very nice small um, little soft ones. So once the back is examined, we'll look at the front of the painting. We'll look at the ground layers, the paint layers, the varnish layers, and all the grime in between. Uh, you can see one very, very small cleaning test right above the knee of Jesus right there. Do you see that white, kind of white circular spot? That's the first cleaning test. So that is removing all of the grime and all of the varnish that's on top of a painting and revealing the original paint layer. Um, the paint layer was very flaky it was unstable, and I'm sorry, I don't have pictures of that, but prior to anything, um, any kind of cosmetic work, as we call it, we stabilized the painting. So we put down all of the lifting paint with a conservation adhesive. Uh, with something that big, it's very important to do larger cleaning tests. Our cleaning tests are usually very small, so if you bring your personal painting into our lab, you probably won't even see it. We do it on the side, somewhere on the side of a painting, um, to give ourselves an idea of how the restoration is going to go. With something that big and something that has so much overpaint on it, we needed to open up bigger windows. We call them windows. So, whoop! Um, ooh, I'll come back to that in a sec. Um, so this is what we did. So you st still see the small cleaning spot uh, above the knee over there, and then these kind of large windows where we're removing with solvents uh, the layers of varnish. Just to go back for a second, um, varnishes that have been used in the past were usually natural resin varnishes. Uh, the Mar Mastic, for example, and those tend to discolor with time. So the yellow, um, they can be almost the color of um, kind of an amber brown. And that was very common. Nothing else was available to artists at that time. Right now, we have more stable synthetic resin varnishes uh, that do not discolor, um, that remain soluble in the solvents that we use. And this is just kind of an example of our little test kit, our go-to, um, that we try on each painting to see what's gonna work better. Um, our aim is to remove the non-original layers without affecting the original paint. There's a lot of chemistry that goes into it. Um, in fact, everyone who's, who goes through the conservation school has Oh my God, years and years of chemistry, <laughs> even to apply, uh, even to apply to this graduate um, program in conservation. So we kind of combine, you know, we combine um, art history, um, kind of artistic techniques and chemistry to do our work. So some close-ups as well. Um, and you can see how dull the varnish is. You know, you can almost see how much grime is on the surface. And what these windows also revealed is, um, for example, in the neck of Mary, how much damage there is, how much previous restoration went into the piece, and fortunately, most of that previous restoration could be removed. Um, a lot of the restoration was done with oil paints in the past, and um, oil paints cross-link over time and become insoluble. So sometimes, even if we want to remove past, past restorations from a, paint, from a painting, it's almost impossible to do. They kind of become as hard as a rock. So in this case, we were really, really lucky that we were still, be, you know, we were still able to take off these um, 
restorations that changed over time. And they probably looked beautiful when they were done. You know, but um, paintings, the original paint layers and the restorations changed in different ways over time. So you often see restorations becoming darker or becoming lighter. And it's not that the restorer or conservator in the past didn't do a good job, it's just that the materials that were available were not as, um, as good as you know, we have today. I don't think in this case. I don't believe in this case. I actually, um, yeah. David Marquis, my colleague, started the project. Um, I was not there during the first stages of it, I have to confess. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's the materials they used. Mm -hmm. So I expect that this painting had numerous restoration. It's, you know, um, a 17th century painting. There must have been at least several campaigns of restoration, at least several revarnishing, because um, when you have something hanging in the collection or if a dealer is getting ready to sell it, you just put a varnish on it. It's going to look so much better. You know, so these kind of layers of varnish and layers of retouching on top of the varnish, you're building it up and building it up rather than taking everything off and starting afresh. So um, I think, and I'll show you, there were some restorations that we were not able to take off as well. But mostly it was the materials used, uh, maybe because they were within the layers of the varnish rather than on the original paint as well. Kind of a mixture of that, I would say. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly, yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we see, we see a lot of very dark pictures. You know, we work a, lo a lot on these kind of traditional masters. And um, after looking for a while, you expect what the colors are going to be. You know, there weren't so many pigments available in the 17th century or 16th century. And it was a very traditional approach, so I don't want to say they all kind of looked alike, but, you know, they had similar uh, tonalities and simi similar vibrance to them. So you kind of, you expect it to look a certain way. So you can, uh, as you said, look through the layers of varnish, that layer, l layers of history, to what it should look like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, because I mean, you can't see, in the back of Mary, you can't see anything. You cannot see any variation of space. It becomes a flat space, um, and it was never a flat space. You know, there was a room behind her, there's a window, so the artist is playing with, you know, all of these three-dimensional kind of constructions that you basically cannot read. Clouds as well. It was an absolutely just flat painting because of the amount of layers that were on it. Um, Grime, just um, swab with grime. Uh, but we work with uh, very small swabs uh, when we clean a painting. Even something that big, we're going to work with a teeny bitty cotton swab. So it's a very controlled, precise way of taking up grime layers and then varnish layers. Uh, we often work in stages too. So first remove the grime with a certain solution, then remove a varnish with another solution and, and kind of proceed as safely as we can. Did you have a question? Yeah, 
Yep, I'm gonna get to that. I have some slides about that. Yeah, mm -hmm. good question. Can, can we wait on that? Okay, thanks. <laughs> okay. Yes. Days. I mean, days, I mean, days of actually working at it. You know, not stepping away and having lunch, but actually days sitting there and removing it. Mm -hmm. How um, usually, it, it really depends. Uh, usually one person works on a painting. It can be hard with something that big, especially to have many hands involved. Uh, we try to be as removed as we can, so we're, we're trying not to impart any of, of our own, you know, feelings into it, be it within painting or cleaning, but each hand is always a little bit different, in a sense. So, um, especially when it comes to in painting, it's almost a little dangerous to have several people work on it, um, because you kind of lose, of tr lose track of where the losses are, you, you know, by looking at other people's, uh, other person's work, for example. So usually it's one person on something this big, David and I work together, especially in the later stages, um, because of, you know, uh, deadlines and just the amount of work that there is for one person. But cleaning, usually one person would clean it. All right. um, so here you see the before treatment and a clean state. And um, this is a treat because we don't show paintings in a clean state to people usually, you know? <laughs> so take it all in. Um, uh, this is, it's a lot of damage, but we also have to keep in mind that it's a 17th century painting. So we've seen worse. I don't wanna say it's in a good condition, but it's, you know, it's in a fairly poor condition. Um, could be worse. Um, I also, so we talked about, I wish I had a pointer, um, previous restorations that could not be taken off. If you look in the, around the Holy Spirit, um, in the clouds, in the kind of yellow area, there's darker, more orange spots. That's uh, oil retouching that cross-linked and could not be removed safely. So if we were gonna go to remove it, we would probably remove original ground layer with it. So if we can't do it safely, we just stay away from it. And then we can in-paint on top of it to minimize it. A uh, couple of other things I wanna talk about is just general changes that a painting goes through, that pigments go through, um, alterations that happen over time. Uh, with Miri, with her garment, that kind of a really nice um, deep red, kind of almost maroon, purplish color. Uh, the artist used a lot of glazes, uh, red lakes, and that type of pigment tends to lose its color over time. It fades. It fades with light. We see this with, I can probably point, uh, at least a couple pictures in this collection, but basically with um, traditional, you know, 14th century, 15th century, 16th, 17th century paintings. Something you can't control, um, and something you can never get back. It, it is uh, an alteration because of light, because of an exposure to light. So unfortunately, her garment has lost a lot of that, sh you know, sh those shadows that were present originally. In the background, in the area of the sky, you see that it's kind of almost grayish. Um, it was probably a much more intense blue before. While we didn't do any analysis, I think that the artist used smalt. It's a blue pigment. Uh, it's actually a glass. And once again, that pigment tends to lose color over time. Um, just a fun fact, Rembrandt used a lot of smalt. So you see uh, his paintings as kind of brownish overall, where in fact, in the beginning, they had much more color to them. Uh, another pigment that I think is present um, in the landscape, once again, behind her, um, it's almost kind of mucky brownish color. That used to be much more green. Um, 
much more lustrous. It, there's a pigment called um, copper resonate, and once again, it undergoes alterations and becomes brown with time. So nothing we can do about those changes, but just kind of to note how much more vibrant the picture would have looked like in the 17th century. Oop. Oh, just another detail. Yeah, and I think right there by um, St. John the Baptist, I think there's more of that retouching that we couldn't remove. Um, the kind of white? So it would be a combination of um, either canvas, if the ground has been lost, ground layer as well, um, or sometimes you know, previous restoration that we couldn't remove. So those dark spots along the bottom edge, those are previous oil restorations that didn't come off. Um, kind of on top by Mary's face, that's more of a canvas. Uh, whiter areas that you see going across her shoulders are previous um, fills. It's probably over time. Um, I, was, I was thinking about it actually yesterday. I was wondering if the canvas may have been either rolled or folded at some point, maybe folded, because there's a kind of almost, there's a couple lines, you know, right down the center over there and then across. Um, we can't quite tell uh, if it was sitting on a stretcher without proper tension and slacking you know, so with deformations being formed, that could have caused the paint to flake off as well. Um, yeah, I think, and, and some of the facts you have mentioned, being close to a kitchen, being exposed to, um, you know, high humidity or um, kind of environmental conditions that were not perfect, I think that all of that could have contributed. too fast. Um, okay, so after the painting was completely cleaned, as much as we could safely clean it without affecting the original paint layers, uh, we proceeded to the compensation stage. So filling came first, um, and that is probably <laughs> one of the most challenging parts for something that big. Um, when you have kind of thin paint layers and very thin fills, it's really hard to get them correctly. Um, we basically need to mimic the texture of the canvas and the texture of the paint with our fills in order to then proceed to in painting. If our fills are not correct, you will always see where we've been. You will always see where the damage was before. So you can kind of see these matte spots all over, just toned, that those are just fills before the final uh, stages of in painting. And you just see my colleague here working on another painting using um, pigmented microcrystalline wax. That is something that's reversible, easily reversible uh, in the future if someone needs to come in and take it off and for some reason redo it. <laughs> Though I would not recommend it. We put it horizontally, yes, yes. So, mm -hmm. yeah, we laid it down on a, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, so we move it around as much as we can when it's flat. Um, I mean, you can, you can kind of, so, I mean, it's a, it's a large painting, but it's not, it's not huge, huge. So if I'm, if I'm standing on the side of the painting, okay, not when I'm eight months pregnant, but, you know, in general, I can reach over to the middle of it. Um, yes, it's, it's better to do things flat. We build up the canvas uh, with something underneath so it doesn't sag. So we can put pressure on it. That is much more complicated. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I was thinking about that actually. That, that would be much more complicated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, some, we work upright if we have to. Yeah, build up um, the canvas from the back. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, exactly. Yeah. 
Um, so uh, the wax is applied in this case. It's a pigmented wax. Um, just with heat, with a kind of hot pan, and then it's textured to match the canvas weave. And another, um, we have a lot of different filling materials. We, we make our gesso, you know, we have a lot of white fills or slightly toned fills. With a large painting like this, it's more beneficial to have a fill that's pigmented to kind of, you know, kind of match the color of the original because it gives you a better perspective where, when you're coming in and in painting it. You don't have bright wi white spots scatter scattered all around, um, kind of throwing you off when you're doing your in painting. So you already have a base to work with. There's just some details. Like you can see, it's matte, you know, it doesn't quite match, but it provides a good base for us to work with. Mm -hmm. mm. Nope. Exactly. There are conservation studios, I would say restoration studios, not conservation studios, that do that. That have a person that just cleans paintings or just in paints pa or just lines paintings. For example, there's, you know, a lining person. Um, that I don't think is a good way to work on a work of art. I think it's important to understand it from the beginning to the end, to understand the process, to understand the structure of it. Um, you know, we do a lot of art historical research as well as we're proceeding with our treatment. So kind of dividing it up between people doesn't give you the same results. You become so familiar with something like this when you're cleaning. You know, if I'm cleaning a painting, after a while, I know where every damage is. I know where, you know, there's a flake of paint missing here, there's a flake missing there. It just, you know, you can close your eyes and basically see it at night because you're so close to it for so many days. Um, even if you don't like the painting in the beginning, you tend to, you know, you kind of tend to love it at the end just because of how much time you spend together. Um, so I think it's important for conservators to take it through the entire process. Of course, we need help sometimes, and we work in groups sometimes too. But yeah, but, but that's important. Question about compensation. <laughs> um, so in painting, um, it's an oil painting. We would never use oil to in paint on it. So our... Um, kind of ethics, our guidelines dictate that whichever materials we use, whatever we do to a painting, should be reversible, should be stable. We never work in areas on top of the original. We only work in areas of loss. Uh, so the, these are just a couple examples of um, in painting media that we use. These are dry pigments and watercolors. Um, the dry pigments are used in a synthetic resin binder. That is not gonna discolor, that is not gonna change with time. So thanks to you know, modern science, we now have much better materials available. Where people used oil in the past, it would alter differently. It would, you know, it would become darker with time than the original paint layer, just because of the changes that take place over time. Um, these will not change. And we know that, I shouldn't say they won't ever change, but we kind of know that for, from experience, they've been used for half a century and you can go back to those paintings treated 50, 60 years ago and the restorations still look amazing. So kind of as our field is developing, um, we're getting better and better materials that we can use. Um, so just an example of a palette, we mix Everything, you know, um, we match everything by eye. There's no formula to it. Um, so I have my palette of pigments. I have my medium, 
that will kind of dictate my gloss. I can make something more glossy, I can make something more matte to match the painting. I can build it up thicker to, to match the impasto or the canvas weave, can make it thinner, uh, can make a glaze out of it. So basically it's all done by eye and it's all done by feel. Um, there's a lot of kind of sensitivity that goes into it and there's no formula whatsoever. Um, it's, really, it's really hard to make um, new paint look old, you know, something that is very new to give it that sense of a 17th century painting. So we do a lot of layering. We, we do a lot of putting on and taking away, putting on and taking away. Um, if you think of a structure of a painting, you have your ground layers, you have your paint layers, you have light kind of going through it and reflecting back at different angles. You have this kind of like translucency. And that's what we're trying to mimic with our in-painting. So there is a picture of a scalpel, for example. Um, so if I'm applying a layer of paint, I may take some back, I, I may scratch away at it and reapply again. Kind of trying to make it look like a 17th century paint, <laughs> not a 21st century paint layer. Uh, we work with teeny bitty brushes. Some examples there, some of them have, you know, just a couple hairs on them, um, often not under magnification in order not to go over the original, in order to only work in areas of loss. And that's kind of a change from um, previous tradition of restorations where you would have um, dealers as restorers who would want to kind of beautify your painting very quickly. And what we find when we take off those restorations is that they really do go over the original paint layers. So often, by taking them off, we regain a lot of the original information that was lost. So here it is after treatment, how it looks. Um, and as I mentioned before, you know, we, we never attempted to get it back to its kind of new original state. So if you look at the background, for example, yes, the sky is still kind of grayish. Um, we don't want to invent the sky, we don't want to put more blue into it. It would be our own interpretation of what the painting should look like. Um, same with the background, um, those hills, those rolling hills, they still look a little brown. Once again, we can't, um, there is no way for us to know what that green looked like originally. So we're only working with the information that we have so if we can look under the microscope and see a pigment and kind of knit it back together, we'll do that. But if nothing is there, we're not gonna invent it. Um, her robe looks much better because a lot of those red glazes could be seen under magnification. So we basically use the information that was there to bring it back and to, to put back some of those shadows in her garment. Um, just some more details, kind of um, clean state and after. Yeah, so on the bottom you, can, you see instead of removing the um, oil paint restorations, we glazed over them thinly to make them, um, you know, disappear or almost disappear to integrate them into the painting. Some, there was some reconstruction um, that had to happen, for example, with the foot right there, that foot of Jesus, or his chin, um, or the hands, um, just because it was missing, but it's such a crucial part of a painting, you know, you can't, you can't leave that child without a foot. Um, so you have to, you know, there are certain kind of compromises that have to um, be achieved. Uh, varnishing, um, that's um, one of the final stages. And as I mentioned before, um, earlier, we had natural resin varnishes available to artists. So those discolor, yellow, become brittle with time and need to be changed every, you know, 50, 60 years or so. Uh, right now, with some of the advances in, chemical, in, in chemistry, we have uh, synthetic resin varnishes that supposedly <laughs> will last for hundreds and hundreds of years without becoming insoluble. They don't darken. They provide good saturations. 
saturation to the painting. Um, we have different application methods. So there you see me brushing a really large painting as well. Um, and then under you see David spraying a painting. So we kind of um, work not only with different materials, but different techniques of application to achieve the desired look. We can make things more glossy, we can make things more matte, whatever is appropriate for that type of painting, for that type of period um, in art. Um, lastly, um, and this is not this painting again, I apologize, it's a different painting, but uh, whatever comes through the lab, we put a backing board on it. Uh, backing boards are important to protect it from accumulation of dust, but also from damage that can happen during transport. Um, we just had, kind of as an aside story, we had a painting um, which had a backing board. It's been treated in our lab and a drone flew into it. Somebody had a little drone inside their house. It flew into the painting, stretched the canvas, but it bounced off the backing board. So it didn't tear it. I mean, there was a lot of paint loss around it, but the backing board being so close to the canvas helped, you know, protect it from a major tear and much more, you know, much worse damage. Um, I kind of joke that we'll see more and more damage by drones in the future on our paintings, you know, kind of as a little aside. Um, but also, also as you're transporting the painting, even though we're 10 minutes away from here, as you're you know, bringing it up the stairs or the elevator, as you're hanging it, having that backing board protection is really essential. We see a lot of damage from homes, you know, just because there is nothing in the back. And I think that's about it. So um, just one more time, the image of how it looked during treatment and um, thank you all very much and thanks Margaret for organizing this and being so helpful. I'm just gonna put this down, is that okay?